when I gave my job talk two and a half years ago, I made the case for a more performance-based practice of landscape architecture. I stated that the rhetoric of contemporary landscape architecture proposed to operate in a more instrumental way. Designers are seeking to engage with performance systems to supplement and enhance the cultural practices of the profession. The aspiration was to match and even exceed the sum value of more typically instrumental design practices, like civil engineering. I presented my own approach as being two, as, as, as two projects. One, to help the core of landscape architecture operate as a more instrumental practice, as demonstrated in my book and other projects. And the second project sought to improve the design of landscape infrastructures and engage within territories of instrumentality where landscape architecture often has little agency. And th this is the research I've conducted under the umbrella of my Landscape Morphologies Lab, a research entity that I founded in 2010 to study the design of performance landscapes. And this latter project has been the focus of my work since I started my tenure track at USC, and this is the work I'm going to share with you tonight. I'm going to begin by describing uh, my theoretical project in regard to my ongoing research on two regional infrastructures, the Los Angeles River and the Owens Lake, two places I've long been associated with. The landscape architect has always been an agent of reconciliation. The traditional reconciliation was between nature and art. Gardens and parks negotiate the space between wilderness and society. Now landscape architecture finds its potency in reconciling our bodies with the urban condition. We make our machinic cities livable through the insertion, somewhat ironically, of reconditioned wilderness. Naturally, the profession is sought to, to escape from the so-called semantic reserve of the park or garden and disarm the machinic condition outside. It asks, can we reduce this dichotomy? Can we make society's most significant urban projects, our infrastructural landscapes, less alienating and more human, embedded with more of our values? How do we reconcile with something that is ostensibly of our own making? In my recent work, I propose that this impulse can be advanced by an instrumental reconciliation, an idealized relationship between society and the tools which have built it. The tools in question, generally those of civil engineering, rely on synoptic re representations, powerful <laughs> simplifications that incidentally reduce or eliminate the representations of human space. <coughs> With their focus on operational efficiency, these tools replace representations a place with economic parameters, at times disconnecting the body and its sensibilities from design. The influence of this relation with our tools is evident within the single function forms of infrastructures. We admire these forms for their legibility. They are sort of living diagrams of force, yet there, always, yet there also seems to be an almost perverse lack of space or consideration of place um, and I think this is an extravagant shortcoming in an urban condition. Still, we rely on civic infrastructures that are predictably operational, efficient, and, and no matter how much we lament their shortcomings, scale, public oversight, and policy ensures that the tools that measure and optimize these systems will remain powerful determinants of design. My proposal is to curate the powerful tools that design these systems, rather than being the inadequate author of new ones. Instead of imagining more human worlds, I build a more human interface for world-making tools. Thus, my focus is just as much on the interface as the tools themselves. The interface is broadly defined as the liminal space where human impulse is translated into our tools and instruments. The interface is increasingly recognized as a significant cultural object that has a pervasive influence within our society. Thus identified, it can become the site where we recognize and recalibrate our implicit relationship with the tools that define agency and power. According to Brandon Hookway, author of Interface, an interface, quote, describes the way in which humanness is implicated in relation with technology. My projects propose that building augmented interfaces will create a more human relation with these tools and will ultimately produce a more conciliatory built condition. We can create operationally competent, phenomenally rich landscapes that are legitimized in part by their relationship to established tooling. My ongoing work on the Owens Lake, and particularly a project I'm just finishing, my rapid landscape prototyping machine, or greetings from Owens Lake, 
was my original impetus for developing this approach. And the project can be divided into three parts, and they illustrate my ideas about, about interfaces. The beginning of the project was a direct engagement with the site and its design via a series of funded graduate studios. This led to an impulse to build an improved design interface, a response to the failure of existing toolings to provide placemaking values, and specifically to provide state-mandated public trust values. Following this, tools were collected, developed, and integrated into a new advanced design interface. And finally, the system was adapted for a broader public engagement. And so I'll go through each of these aspects in a little more detail. The metrics of cost and resource use loom heavy over the design of the Los Angeles Department of Water, Power, Water and Power's Owens Lake Dust Control Project. The project aims to control <coughs> dust on an alkaline lake dried by the Los Angeles Aqueduct, which had become the nation's single greatest source of the highly dangerous PM10 particulate pollution. Due to the gigantic scale of the dust control projects, now covering over 40 square miles of the approximately 100 square mile lake, a single additional dollar per square foot can easily add tens of millions of dollars in cost, and water use can exceed the annual consumption of many cities. As of now, the project has cost over one and a half billion dollars, with a stated annual water use equivalent to that of San Francisco. Engineers, under pressure from their managers and constituents in the city of Los Angeles, have therefore been exceedingly motivated to find dust control designs and methods that minimize the use of these resources. And, and the aqueduct is actually shut off this year because of these uses, environmental uses. However, tempering the design of a maximally efficient system of dust control, and this is an example of a rejected uh, dust control iteration, um, is a state mandate require, mandated requirement that all navigable bodies of water and former ones um, abide by public trust doctrine. And this requires the accommodation of public values such as ecological, recreational, aesthetic, and scientific um, and particularly ones exclusive to this kind of feature. And this suggests a future for the lake that must not just be infrastructural, but rather embody multiple values to become an attraction and place of substance and interest. Thus, my utopian impulse for reconciliation asks, could the modern tools of infrastructure design be rearranged to search for and discover new possibilities for value and place within efficient operational models? What would happen if representations and even measurements of public values had a footing within the operational design process? There is an understanding that these considerations would be marginal relative to the concerns of operation, perf performance, and cost, but an appropriate design process could potentially discover ways to maximize public trust values while using less water. In the case of the Owens Lake, an idealized interface could relate the powerful tools of operational design to the scale and methods necessary for the design of multiple value placemaking. The interface would allow design solutions that engage both ph phenomenological considerations of place as well as efficiency. The resulting design would be distinguished as the product of a careful and even playful reconciliation of transdisciplinary tools and methodologies. The interface would engage our powerful human intuition with our highest and most synthetic manifestation of expertise. Thus, the Owens Lake Rapid Landscape Prototyping Machine is designed as a comprehensive, that really didn't turn out, uh, interface to, to engage the impulses and sensibilities of a designer within the constraints of a complex infrastructure. Through its looped engagement with computer simulations and user inputs, the interface forms orig informs original impulses and translates them into adjustments of the design tools. The result is immersive, yet precisely contained exploration of design options. The feedback loop between impulse and instrumentation defines a new space, an interfacial gap where we can witness cognitive steps or even leaps between our inputs and the resulting actions. An ideal interface creates these formative gaps where design is both legitimized by the tools and marked by sophisticated human sensibility. My Owens Lake interface consists of two primary parts. The first is a sedimentary drawing system to generate and represent topographical form. The second is a custom analysis and simulation software to calibrate the design to any remaining factors. 
Together, they immerse a user in consequential engineering parameters alongside the rich and eccentric qualities of place and ecology. The primary space for reconciliation between instruments and place is the latter, the custom software I developed that, that I developed in the processing language. The software allows a designer to, re to, to distribute a variety of established dust control techniques based on terrain and real-time adjustments of water use. From this, the software instantly creates a rendered simulation of the design that can be explored in a first-person perspective and with a set of environmental controls to select time and season. Simultaneously, the corresponding plan rendering on the right is projected onto the model, rendering the physical topography and providing a more typical view of planning. Overlaid on the projection are adapted tools for real-time measurements of capital cost, water use, and suitability for six habitat types. The software also has a set of original experiential analysis tools, including real-time view shed, angle of incidence, and visual grounds. This combination of views, tools, and controls creates a dialectic between operation and experience missing in almost all previous planning efforts. The first part, sand modeling, was chosen as an ideal medium for developing the topographic form of dust control, as it is both intuitive and computationally relevant. Although my use of sand is sometimes mistaken as a simulation of dust, for this project, sand modeling is a fast physical computational device for sedimentary construction. On the lake, topographic form can reduce wind speeds and allow vegetative growth above the salt water table, among other effects. As, as a sedimentary modeling system, the sand physically computes balanced cut fill and unreinforced form, and forces construction by sequential operations. This engagement places the desi a designer within a paradigm of logical form making, one that is augmented by the software system, 3D scanning device, and a digital projector. As it turned out, this interface, particularly the sand modeling, was, was highly productive because it was actually playful this was an immersive and rewarding place with, with, within which to develop form, while also simultaneously rigorous and constrained by virtue of being a physical system. And it's important to note that in this context, play means, some, play means not the opposite of work, but instead takes on a more modern definition and value. Play now commonly describes relations with technologies between um, many of which barely distinguish between work and the, tr the traditional idea of play. To play a video game, a work training simulation, or operate a drone is to engage fully with this, within the so-called magic circle of rules and actions within an interface. As such, play represents a necessary goal in the creation of interfaces. Inducing play requires the careful definition of an interfacial space, a suitably confined place that triggers a cascading response between our human impulses and the solution space presented by the interface or game. The shape of this interfacial space is critical in determining the nature of the design exploration. Creating a productive magic circle for the eccentric conditions at the Owens Lake was, was intricate work. Um, but eventually, with this interface, my lab generated dozens of dust control proposals that we eventually winnowed down into 17 final alternatives. And this is a selection of a couple of those. So the last part is the public engagement. Um, for many infrastructure projects, the large territory they occupy ne necessitates engagement with a broad spectrum of constituents and their social imagination. The interface and models developed for this project can also be used to focus diverse inputs and engage a variety of constituents in a process of design. To engage with the public at the Owens Lake Dust Control Project, my software was modified um, well, I modified my software embedded within a machine that resembles a stand-up arcade game, but with the physicality of a penny arcade or record player. A familiar arcade-style interface is positioned before a platform where models are inserted. To play, a user selects a sand model, vacuum-formed and framed, and slides it over the top of the machine. The software then loads the appropriate digital model inserting the user into a first-person landscape simulation of the lake bed. The plan rendering is projected onto the plastic relief topography, along with a set of critical parameters and dynamic analysis. Users are encouraged to adjust landscape parameters for the purpose of creating two postcard views of their preference. As a reward for the participation, the machine prints a postcard of their making. 
the process of making a postcard, what I think is a surprisingly talismanic object, is a means to motivate and focus the engagement. While users express their judgment in searching for a suitable iteration, a, a worthy postcard, the system maps their sensibility. Rather than automatically reinforcing accepted ideas of place, the machine creates an opportunity to define and validate new typological models of landscape that are tuned to the infrastructural parameters in place. The secondary value of the public engagement is harder to measure, but it is likely that this engagement engenders a political shift in our societal approach and imagination for this place in ways akin, though clearly not as effective, to picturesque landscape paintings in the 18th and 19th centuries. These shifted our relationship to landscapes built and natural by the representation choices. The project was recently exhibited in a group show called After the Aqueduct um, at the LA uh, um, contemporary exhibition space, and, um, and almost 100 postcards were made during that time. And um, the next sort of, that my uh, upcoming exhibition, which hasn't happened yet, it got delayed uh, for a number of reasons, including my Rome Prize, will be at the Eastern Sierra Interagency Visitor Center, which is, as you can see, right next to the lake, and has a tremendous num number of users because you have to get your permit to climb Mount Whitney. Um, at, that, at the, that location. So after I have it here and generate and have it there for a number of months, I expect to have a much larger body of work to collect, to think about, and to eventually publish and engage with when I um, come back with the Owens Lake. So my second instrumental reconciliation is engaged with the Los Angeles River, an equally large but much more urban and visible landscape infrastructure project. I've been involved with the river for a long time. I actually came to Los Angeles to work for Mia Lair and Associates on the Los Angeles River Revitalization Master Plan in 2005. Um, and the plan has really turned a corner in terms of instigating the civic planning and design that is going on today, including the Corps of Engineers Los Angeles River Ecosystem Restoration Project, a landmark now $1.3 billion plan to restore ecosystem function in an 11 mile section where there's a soft bottom. Um, and you know, it's just, it should be noted that that amount of money that they're asking is actually $200 million less, and we're desperately trying to get it from the feds, $200 million less than we've spent on the Owens Lake, just the city alone. Um, my first USC studio on the river funded by the Bureau of Engineering and at the LADD, LADWP, employed a modified physical hydraulic modeling s system <coughs> to test the hydraulic viability of various designs for an Army Corps pilot project. The work was proof of concept of whether modeling the river was useful for multifunctional design and could be accomplished as a multidisciplinary project spearheaded by landscape architects. Building on this studio and others, uh, Army Corps engineer and longtime USC affiliated Steve Dwyer and I helped broker an official agreement and official research and collaboration agreement between the USC School of Architecture and the Los Angeles District of the, of the Army Corps of Engineers, and we have a press release coming out soon. Uh, it is a sort of landmark agreement, as they, these are usually with schools of engineering, not architecture. Um, and of course, it comes at a critical junction as they are just beginning to design the Los Angeles River. Um, project, and you know, even though there will be many consultants involved with the Los Angeles River, including Frank Gehry, of all people, um, the Corps will still remain the primary contractor and manager for the massive ecosystem project, which is, I think, the marquee project at this moment. Um, this agreement and other studio cl cl collaborations has led to my most recent proposed project, my Los Angeles River Integrated Design Lab. Um, it represents another instrumental reconciliation I see as a correction for the lost opportunities to design the river for multiple values when they modeled it uh, in the 1940s and 1990s. While engaged with my, within my ideas of interface design, the lab is broadly conceived as a multidisciplinary project to provide integrated design support and research for the Corps River Project and other plans. Over the last couple of months, I've assembled a team of partners to guide and enhance the research and outreach. Should we turn the lights up or just go to the next slide? I guess we're fine. Um, under the tutelage of expert hydraulic modelers, we will construct physical models of the river at the Bureau of Engineering's Hydraulic Research Laboratory in Elysian Valley. Um, 
this, we're going to clean it up. It's a little bit uh, messy right now. But the, so the LA Bureau of Engineering um, and USC has drafted an MOU to give us near full access to the lab for 40 months, including our own dedicated modeling space and uh, in-house training and expertise. The facility gives us the space and large pumps to build models to represent large reaches of the river. Also, we can do very detailed models and run high flows through them. Um, and and the, the actual in-kind donation of the space and expertise is worth over a quarter million dollars. And contrary to what these black and white photos might suggest, the phys physical hydraulic model compared to numerical or digital models is not an old-fashioned approach. A physical hydraulic model has many advantages over numerical models in terms of modeling complex behaviors and spatial resolution. And I've been told that the Army Corps the Army Corps Ecosystem Restoration Project will almost certainly require extensive physical modeling. So instead of restricting the final and likely highly influential river modeling to the Army Corps Hydraulic Lab in Vicksburg, Mississippi, the Riddle Lab will let us let expert teams and constituents develop multi-purpose designs locally and integrated with hydraulic analysis from the beginning. The models will mirror the, certif the, the required certified engineering models but will be augmented to engage and represent multiple aspects of design. The models will let us explore in both sketch-like processes and rigorously design and examine specific technical challenges. Furthermore, with the additional technology developed by my lab, uh, as I have at the Owens Lake, such a model can become a comprehensive format to explore and communicate multiple aspects of the design, whether represented physically, digitally, or as a hybrid. This comprehensive interface will create a common ground where designers, engineers, scientists, policymakers, constituents can overcome the complex constraints of the river. Hopefully we can help maximize the quality and suitability of the river's design allowable within its very real set of constraints. So we're in the process of funding this work by local granting agencies. Um, and I also plan to expand this project in a number of directions focused by the strengths of the interests of my partners. So the, this intermediate moment of my research into, into design interfaces begins to manifest a contemporary agenda for landscape architecture in relation to a broader transdisciplinary world of instrumentation. The project of the interface suggests that we must not only improve our own tools in metrification, but must equally seek to empower our human impulse and body within these tool sets to discover beauty and value. While the profession has long been interested in enhancing its performance through more pre pre precise tool sets, now that we have access to these tools, the challenge is to harness the more nebulous and neglected intuitive synthetic power of the individual and community. So the next thing I'm gonna to talk to you is about a uh, proposal, uh, on a book project that's underway. Implicit to the development of an improved interface and the empowering of place sensibilities within infrastructural design is that we can recognize and value the, the placemaking attributes or opportunities of infrastructure. Our impulses to reject and radically transform many of these spaces may seem self-evident given their safety issues, noisome attributes, and their designed exclusion of human occupation. However, given that many of the maxims of performance, efficiency, and production that determine their unsatisfactory form will remain powerful influences, the concrete isn't, going all, isn't all going away, to what extent can and do we value these infrastructural spaces? How far are they from something that we can occupy or even celebrate in a timely way? This was the cover for today. To what extent do we unconsciously reject these constructions because they don't match typical models of space? Is our distaste due to the limits of our imagination or real irrefutable attributes? In the case of the Los Angeles River, the current river stands as a sort of joke compared to our archetypal image of a river. Not only is the river channel objectively bleak and uninviting, but we are haunted by what a river should look like. Yet to those who understand even a little of hydraulic mechanics, anything resembling a full restoration is almost impossible to achieve. While officiated by the Corps' current plan, the collective aspiration to radically recover our, last, our lost natural river will inevitably be curtailed by flood protection, cost optimization, and maintenance concerns. 
thus constrained but still following this impossible model for what is now an indelibly urban river, may lead us to a staid river vernacular, a fixed fluvial-like form, rather than anything near to restored condition. An improvement, but a generic expression of river. Or alternatively, if focused entirely on ecosystem function, we may end up with, a value, engineered, with, with value engineered planters and habitat, unsuited and unconsidered for an urban condition. It is within this gray zone between restoration and everything else that our process and social imagination is weakest. Popular rhetoric wavers between poles of an idealized civic or ecological restoration and the dystopic river that is setting for car chases and homeless encampments. In Michael Pollan's brilliant first book, Second Nature, he noted that we lack an ethic between Thoreau's idea of idealized, supposedly without humans, nature, and the lands that we use in some way. If it's not untouched by humans, it is, quote, food for developers. Landscape architecture, inherently focused on reconciliation, has positioned itself to operate within this middle ground and has been instrumental in defining the parameters of the synthetic and civic revitalization of the river and notably not advocating for a restoration. However, even so, my profession can expand its recognition and understanding of alternative models of place within infrastructure. The unexpected, the unexpected middle grounds that are in fact most naturally suited to these places. Models that may not be well recognized or registered in the broader social imagination. For example, while top-down plans for the river are slowly enacted and endlessly imagined and debated, a vibrant bottom-up culture of use and intervention is flourishing along the river. For decades, people have found ways to make the river their own, long before any wholesale restoration or civic transformation was even considered. And nowadays, these river actors are demonstrating in very real ways what are perhaps the most innovative or at least most efficient ways to appreciate and value the infrastructural space of the concrete river. River kayaking, once a guerrilla activist action, is now legal and even a source of bragging. The arts programming or organization Clock Shop and a collaborator in my lab treats the urban river as a novel kind of wilderness and has regular quickly and, and quickly sold out campouts along the river. There are outdoor movies, picnics on the exposed horizontal banks, informal art installations, and there is, a, there is a near constant stream of people walking out onto the severe concrete channel adjacent to downtown LA to conduct photo shoots. A recently produced oversized deck of cards shows you, uh, shows you at least 56 ways how to enjoy the river as it is now. There's four wild cards. Earlier this summer, the Bloomberg Foundation awarded a $1 million grant to build public art along the river. These projects and larger ones, such as the Lenoria Water Wheel by Lauren Bond in the Metabolic Studio, distinguish themselves by reveling in the strange middle ground. The Lenoria is both a nostalgic infrastructure reference and a contemporary water resource infrastructure. With a grand gesture, it draws water out of the river for local uses. This sort of reinterpretation of infrastructural industrial place has played an outsized role in some of our most visible landscape projects in the last decade, such as the High Line and Duisburg Nord Park. Clearly, the spatial and material territory of infrastructure offers some of the most exciting design opportunities. However, what distinguishes the LA River and, the, and Owens Lake interventions is that they must operate within or, or very near to an, a live operational infrastructure. They must be adapted to its fundamental performance parameters and even to its parameters of design production. They must find room to operate within an active engine of infrastructure infrastructural function and production. And this is an altered design agenda. Any inclusion of other values requires perfect integration. Operational parameters overshadow all else. Barring unlimited resources, there's far less room to transform these infrastructures into established or natural models of place. What is rarely recognized with, about the bottom-up interventions is the extent to which they are cleverly adapted to functioning infrastructural form and performance. Without the resources to make whole-scale change, they work with the engineered condition to make place. Even if playing against the engineered space, these strategies are carefully attuned to it. For me, the bottom-up strategies just represent the clearest expression of clever infrastructure-adapted placemaking. Designers at all levels of intervention can leverage the unique qualities of these systems to create effective ecologies and places. 
design strategies by, that by virtue of their inventive integration maximize resources and maintain infrastructural function. So while prior, a priori models are worth seeking in some cases, if such a range of resourceful strategies were better known and considered, they should compel any and all investments into infrastructure to seek multiple values. Therefore, in an effort to pool and thus characterize design strategies for making place within active infrastructures, I'm currently working on a book on the subject. The working title for the proposed book that has been a research focus this year is Genius Ingenium, Models for Making Place in Ecology and Infrastructural Landscapes. The likely publisher will be Berkhauser. Um, the book, like my last one, seeks through its ep explication of case studies a topical design manifesto. The term genius in ingenium is my variation on the established landscape idea of genius loci, also known as the genius of place. The, the, the design concept that there is a fundamental and specific essence to a site, and in practice the quality is the mo th that, that this quality is the most valuable basis for a landscape intervention. The book transposes this historical concept into, onto infrastructural landscapes, where the genius of place is also largely determined by the efficiencies and eccentricities of the infrastructure engineering or ingenium. The spatial and operational terroirs of the infrastructural landscapes, while often portrayed as dystopic, are increasingly being reimagined through a diverse set of strategies. The book counteracts the siloing of these strategies and identifies that they exist upon a spectrum of intervention, ranging from simple engagements to the wholesale design of integrated infrastructures. The book recognizes these as opposite, but converging trajectories. The chapters are thus organized by these two poles of minimum and maximum design intervention. At one end, we are seeing a growing willingness to directly, or with only simple modifications, engage with landscape infrastructures. Ones often designed for cross purposes than human use. These strategies are some of the most exciting and resource efficient, though often limited to adventurous users. The second category looks at simple retrofits of existing infrastructures. Existing form is modified or added to significantly improve its value. The third looks at design variations of established infrastructural forms, such as a solar array adjusted to operate as open space. These represent new constructions where form follows typical functional requirements, but is marginally modified to add, some, to add other values. And the final category focuses on truly hybrid designs, where infrastructural performance and other values are recombined into a novel, multifunctional form. And for me, the, the, the mechanism of disciplinary collaboration is just as interesting as the actual output. Placed along my spectrum, these strategies open up a set of design possibilities otherwise limited by preconceived ideas of placemaking or limited resources. In my, in my research, I'm developing portraits of their various cultures of use alongside examinations of technical and logistical design parameters. Finally, the content of this book will support a set of design principles for infrastructure design and my idea of genius and genium. So lastly, I want to talk briefly about my Rome Prize. Um, the Prince Terrible Trust Award and, and, you know, allows me to study in Rome for a year at the Academy, um, and the prize is based upon my portfolio um, and up, up until now, and then a work proposal. Um, and so my, my Rome Prize proposal touches much of the work presented, um, but expands on themes of experience, visual effect, and sketching. Uh, my proposal for the Rome Prize is to reconcile landscape scenic and aesthetic theories with contemporary ideas of performance in landscape architecture and infrastructural design. And Rome is significant because it was an important stop on the once essential for architects and artists grand tour. And its magnificent ruins and landscapes were the source material for a lot of the scenic theories that are a cornerstone of landscape architecture. In fact, they've been so influential that recent scholars have made them the straw man when introducing the ideas of performance and infrastructure. They declared that the scenic principles impose rigidly upon designs that should be based on, on performance and process. Yet, undisputably, the human experience, the human experiential effect, visual or not, remains an essential component of landscape architecture and a commonly perceived failing of urban infrastructures. 
And while a few influential scholars like Leo Marx and David Nye have related ideas of the picturesque and sublime to technological landscapes, their currency with the design and retrofit of urban land infrastructures, especially semi-natural systems like rivers, seem unresolved. So the, the picturesque and related theories of effect that grew from the Grand Tour in the 18th century still represent some of the most nuanced of their kind and most relatable to design. In fact, they were wholly concerned with, with change, process, and endemic qualities. So in the spirit of how the, the, grant, the sketching of Grand Tour participants informed these theories, my proposal is to study and develop a sketch process that uses my custom software and experience with infrastructural design tools to better reconcile visual experience with contemporary ideas of performance and process. And I will focus these studies on, the, on Rome's, urban, Rome's ur, ur, urban waterways and infrastructures to help prepare for my future work in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>